This is a good move. Why aren't you dancing? Dancing is forbidden. Running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am usually watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode, but this week, we've got something much more important, much more exciting going on. I had the absolute honor and privilege of talking to the one and only Matt Malero, co creator of Aqua Teen Hunger Force, voice of Cybernetic Ghost of Christmas Past from the Future, Markula, and Er. Wow, you're going, you're digging deep. You know more than I do. Look, I don't know that I agree with Matt on this, but I do appreciate that he said it. You can make your own judgments after listening here. But in today's interview, you know we're hitting on Plantasm, the recently released Aqua Teen film. We're talking about Aqua Donk side pieces. Matt answers a billion of my Aqua Teen questions. You know, questions I've had after covering the show for over a year and not finding answers to those questions until now. And we also just get into some of Matt's favorite things. What makes Matt tick? And of course, we are talking a bit about Matt's guitar playing as well. Look, in this interview, Matt talks about a lot of upcoming projects, including, supposedly, there are five Aqua Teen movies that they will be working on. Now, put an asterisk after this. I'm not calling Matt a liar, of course, but he is known to be a jokester. He's known to engage in some monkey business and purposely mislead people. He seems sincere, although you will hear in the interview, I thought he was fucking with me at first, which I now feel bad about, but... Of course, um, just don't go running around saying, wow, there's going to be five more Aqua Teen movies. This is what Matt's saying for now. Anything could change in the future, but we'll get into that. We'll get into Matt's upcoming film, Postocalypse, which is definitely happening and definitely coming out next year for free. And then Matt even leaks some other upcoming things he's working on, stuff that I can't even believe that he even mentioned or talked about. I, I, I don't suspect he's allowed to, but he did. It's in the interview. So, all right, before I drop you off, I want to give a sincere and just huge thank you to Dave Willis for setting this up. I did not ask Dave to reach out to Matt for me, but he did, and I'm just so thankful that he did. And of course, thank you to Matt for for making the time to do this and and being so generous with his time, answering all my questions. All right, you get the idea. Let's jump in and see what Matt's got to say. Let's start off with some plantasm questions here. I'm curious... Was there anybody that you guys wanted to get on the film that you were unable to? Um, no. I, I, well, yes, there was. But I feel like then the first round of casting, Dave and I had some ideas that we agreed on and network pushed us in a little bit of a different direction, more of a modern contemporary angle. But then the people that we ultimately chose who are in the movie were... Um, they were just thrilled to be in it. So we got lucky with that. So, yeah, we put aside the, old, the older ideas we had and said okay now we have to move on to this and then but we found people that was were really great you know paul walter hauser and um, i mean it's just like all those people nailed it would you mind telling me maybe some of the ideas that you had to put aside uh we wanted to get jeff goldblum and uh he was apparently well first of all i think he was really expensive uh we were looking at um who's that guy from third rock from the sun <laughs> oh uh, john lithgow <laughs> yeah we wanted to get him too I don't think even the people at the network knew who he was when we brought his name up. So I kept saying, he was so great in Raising Cane. He was so funny. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think, and then we had a handful of others, but this, that was just because Dave and I grew up watching those people do stuff. And, you know, we weren't, you know, we knew the contemporary people were like, God, these guys, you know, when we cast people, we go for the, just really the voice. It's like, if the voice is what's the character is, is matches that character and the tone you know it doesn't matter to us if it's somebody or nobody if they can nail it that's who we want right i noticed uh the actors you were kind of talking about those guys were in the adventures of buckaroo bonsai yes was that purposeful of you wanting to get them on the film <laughs> no but that's, yeah you're right about that but i'm a huge <laughs> that's my, my second favorite movie in the world that's why that's I how i know stuff. about it because you've talked yeah. about it yeah no but i think i think even dave was like on board with those people too so because he had seen them in other things um so it wasn't just me pushing it i guess i'm curious so aqua Teen ended in 2015 
And then you guys did some small things here or there, but then it came back with Plantasm and Aquadonk side pieces in 2020. Well, you started working on it in 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any experiences in that five-year period for you that kind of influenced your work on the film? No, I think we were just happy to, like, when you know something's getting shut down, you're not going to work on it. You, uh, you have to move on to other projects and ideas. Um, because that's how we make a living. And um, <clears throat> and then when they called and wanted another movie, we were just thrilled. And of course, we said yes right away. So no, I don't think, if I didn't, you know, overthink it for five years, I actually had to move on because that's the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I don't mean so much like, like Aqua Teen ideas, but like something specifically that maybe happened to you that you then reflected in the film just like a life experience or something that you learned like a, a skill that you learned that you then applied to the film well you know what was going on around us at the time that they asked was um like musk was sending people up into space and bezos was going into space and so you know we kind of incorporated some of those eccentric uh you know weirdos in, into our into our movie clearly um as far as a skill i learned well i learned how to record at home because we had to record Aquadont from our houses. <laughs> so I learned how to use Logic Pro. I learned how to connect the mic to it. I, I built styrofoam around my head and, <laughs> and, did the, and did the voices. I literally had three huge sheets of styrofoam with like, with like, you know, clips and I'm standing up in this box and, you know, Dave's doing the same thing at his house. I remember we sent, we, we had to send actors like, iPads with with microphones. I remember David Cross got the, the iPad was still in the box. He was like, "What am I supposed to do with this?" Well, it's like <laughs> unwrap the box first. <laughs> okay, it, it took an hour and a half. So I think I developed some technical skills, which were actually pretty great because I ended up doing a piece of music for the movie when Carl comes bursting through the plants. That's my sort of Scorpions riff. So yeah, I think that that was a skill I learned was some technical audio stuff. You know, I'm really big into the audio side of these episodes and movies. Like it's just like consumes me as much as making the actual, you know, script to animation and all that stuff. Right, right. Yeah, I spoke to Dave and I, I was asking him to kind of um, describe the co-creators he's worked with on his various shows. And that's something he mentioned about you specifically was the fact that you really nailed down on the sound mix and that's not really something that he would mess around with too much so i'm glad to hear you bring that back up again yeah yeah it's true what he said is true um i feel like it adds just as much everything you know it completes it you know, without it if you just go in there and just go well just add these environments and that's goofy sound effect but if you really like think about it it's it's as much as the film and the episode as as the story and the animation right oh, of course yeah yeah. My next question, it's it's a hard one to ask because it's kind of regarding Death Fighter, which you guys are purposely, you know, you uh, don't want to talk about it, which I respect that. But mm -hmm. assuming that Death Fighter ever was a script, which for those who don't know, it is the rumored follow up to the colon movie film for theaters. And some of the Radical Axis guys have talked about it, too, which makes people think it was going to be made at some point. My question really is when you were approached for a new film in 2020, assuming Death Fighter was actually a script, did you guys toy with making that your film or did you instantly know, assuming that was a script, you did not want to make it? We thought about it, but it's so good that we thought, let's wait for the third one. Let's wait till we have more money to make it, you know, because it requires a lot more intense animation and big, more big A-lister actors. So yeah, Death Fighter's been around for a very long time. Uh, we almost brought it back well, did you know we do, we're doing five new ones right now? Five new ones? Yeah. Five new Aqua Teens. Yeah. And so we almost brought it back. In no, this... you're not. You're fucking with me. I'm not, man. I'm back. As soon as I'm done with you, I'm getting back on with Dave. We're wrapping up the first script. So. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, I'm serious. They ordered five more. Am I allowed to put that in the podcast? I don't think it's a problem, honestly. It's not like, I mean, everybody in Atlanta knows. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Death Fighter um, almost the character almost made an appearance in this new one we're writing, but I feel like death fighter is such a special movie to us. Cause it really was like, we made the first one and we're like, man, this is so much fun. And let's make the, let's, let's get death fighter and build his legend and his, 
and his uh, story and his journey. And it was so great, but yeah, we're holding on to that. So, okay. Um, so in Plantasm, there are two new alien races. We have the Japongaloids and the Fraptaculans. Mm -hmm. I was wondering for you kind of what were the inspiration behind those, those two new uh, creatures that we saw? I think uh, coming up with the names, the stupid names, <laughs> led to the inspiration, <laughs> you know? It's like Craptaculans and Japongaloids. It just instantly you think of Goopy. I mean, to us, that's what we did. So inspiration, uh, I think the inspiration was more um, based in like sort of real world slave labor, you know, <laughs> things. <laughs> and a guy like a guy like Neil would actually go as far as to just go grab these races and make them work for him. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I think to us, sometimes words and titles are come first and then the inspiration comes from the silly word or the title, mm -hmm. just like the mm -hmm. name Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I mean, we never toyed with that. We just said Aqua Teen Hunger Force and that was it. And it just <laughs> led to this crazy, you know, run of ridiculousness. I was wondering if we could ever expect to see those characters, not those characters specifically, but those races come back in future Aqua Teen content. Is that something you guys would be open to, or are they really just Plantasm only kind of things? I think they're just standalone in Plantasm. I think that movie works as a as its own thing in this world. So we even debated, like, for these new five, do we pick up from there, or do we just... And so we decided not to. We just, like, Plantasm is its own contained unit. So the title Plantasm is uh, obviously a reference to one of your favorite films, Phantasm. Yes, I know. And <laughs> you know this? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so I actually, I went and watched Phantasm for the first time um, hearing, oh, oh, whoa. Oh, look at this. We got the, uh, uh, Matt's holding up the, the soundtrack on vinyl here. On vinyl. I have three of these. Three, three of the same copy? Yes. Are they like different pressings or is it all the same pressing? I don't know, but I have three of them because they're hard to find. And every time I found one on eBay, I bought it, no matter how much it was. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. So I went, I went and watched the first one. I loved it. It was fucking crazy. Yeah. And I, I'm really excited to watch the, the next. There's like three or four more. Mm -hmm. I was wondering of all of them, which one is your favorite? I assume the first, but. Yeah, the first one is my favorite. The first one is what I was just so enamored with that film. Um, there was something in the in the world that really, it is a good mix of horror and sci-fi, you know, follow these brothers with no like authorities around them trying to solve this crazy stuff that was going on up the street. Um, that was a movie that set me like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make movies. I'm, I'm going to, I want to do this. It was so much, it just like inspired me so much. Um, and still today it's my favorite film, but I never got to really make movies. I got to work on movies and uh, travel around and work on the sequels of things I like. So, yeah, I think the first one's really good. The second one, they had to recast some people because it was a bigger movie. And then the third one, so it, they, they kind of get worse as they go. <laughs> 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 but I still have seen them all and, you know, appreciate them for, for what they are. And, you know, since then, I've, I've become, I'm actually working on a, where I'm developing something with that director right now. Um, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So I met him at Comic-Con a long time ago. And we just started talking and I'm a big fan and he liked a script that I gave him. And, uh, and if you notice like in Aqua Teen, uh, the first Aqua Teen movie near the end, Shake runs in, he's, his idea of helping is running in to get a tan into Tantasm in the yeah. Tantasm. <laughs> yeah. And, and the silver sphere logo is built into the Tantasm. Oh, logo. I didn't even realize that. Cause I didn't see the movie at that point. Oh my yeah, God. That's awesome. It, it's in there. It's the spikes. And so we had to get permission from Don and he said, yes. And then after the movie came out, went to DVD, I met him for lunch and I gave him a copy of the DVD and, and uh, he called and said how much fun it was. And, and he also said the sound work on that was amazing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we do all the movies of Skywalker and uh, we really put a lot into it. So, yeah. So from Tantasm to Plantasm. And obviously Plantasm made sense for this because of what's going on in the thing. And we just I think I just threw it out one day. Dave laughed. And so we kept it. <laughs> well, there's also the uh, slavery influence uh, from Phantasm to Plantasm as well, which I appreciated. Yeah. Crushing the people down in the dwarfs because the, uh, the planet's gravity was so strong. They had to be smaller to go work mm -hmm. for the tall man. Yes, yes. Clearly. Nobody <laughs> that's listening to this is going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be like, what is this? Is this an Aquatine podcast? <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, I'm really excited. Even, even though I, my understanding is the rest of the Phantasm films aren't as good, I'm really excited to see kind of what they did, especially with bigger budgets. And also, I saw one came out in 2016, which is fucking crazy that they're still making these. Yeah, number five. You know, the director of that directed a Winnie the Pooh cartoon. It was so bizarre. So, uh, Oh, really? Yeah. So check that one out, too. They're all good. I mean, they're not good. The first one's only good. The, the other four are not good. <laughs> <laughs> are they at least fun? Yeah, they're always fun. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess my last real plantasmin question for you is, uh, let's say it's 2007, and through some space time travel accident, you in 2007, right after finishing the colon movie film, are able to somehow see plantasm. What do you think you would say about plantasm in 2007 after just having finished colon movie film? I would say, wow, Plantasm has a story. <laughs> There's a character arc. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> the movie we just made is just a bunch of ridiculous dada. <laughs> we try to have a story, but it really doesn't quite fly. <laughs> and plus, I would say it looks so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think, but I think the main thing is that we really tried to put a good story in here, something that would. Almost as if if as if you had if you had never seen the show, you could at least appreciate the story. You know, if you didn't know the characters. So I think it's a pretty it's a pretty organic journey too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, I told I told this to Dave, but I watched it with my wife for the first time, and she's seen a couple Aqua Teen just because I like it, but she doesn't really watch Aqua Teen. But she really liked the movie. She was laughing along and stuff, and you know, obviously she could follow it as opposed to colon movie film she would just be like what the fuck is this like what's happening so exactly yeah i i i, I really i really like it. like that like that's what i was hoping for from an aqua teen movie was what you guys did on plantasm so me personally i i loved it i liked it a lot more than colon movie film as much as i love colon movie film mm -hmm. yeah it was just great to see like an actual structured thing from you guys and see what you did with that yeah so if we could move on to aquadong side pieces really quickly yeah were there any villains that you wanted to bring back that you were unable to there's so many great villains, but I think the ones we hit, we just knew that those were the ones that were the most popular that people really liked. Uh, we were happy to work with any of them. And so the fact that we chose those were great. So it's not like I lament not bringing back somebody. Um, right, right. But yeah, no. I, so no. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Because obviously you guys had 10 episodes. There's like a thousand great villains. Like you're mm -hmm. not going to be able to bring it. So there's going to have to be some cuts and it's always going to be some great classic characters. Yeah. Did you end up having a favorite Aquadonk short? Uh, you know, I think the one that makes me laugh all the way through is that MC Chris one. Um, MC P Pants. It's just so insane. It's so insane. It's almost like there is no story. It's just a bunch of just in your face and silly rap. Dave and I wrote all the lyrics and then uh chris took it and did the did everything else but that's my favorite honestly they're all they're all really good but that's that's the one i would choose to show somebody if they'd never seen one right right yeah and, and i think it shows the power of that character that he can carry the whole short by himself because i don't think like carl's in it visually but he doesn't say anything yeah so it's just mc chris just going the whole time and uh just go into town yeah and every time he gets in trouble he finds it instantly finds a new way around it which is even worse and then he and he turns on a dime at the end and, and like feels bad for the guy, you know. And once, <laughs> I mean, that's that's what I love about it. It's just like a hundred miles an hour of of BS in your face. In a few of the side pieces, as well as in the you know Aqua Teen Hunger Force show proper, specifically in the side pieces, we saw Carl two times listening to the song F Off, which is a 12 ounce mouse song. Mm -hmm. And does that suggest that Aqua Teen and 12 ounce mouse take place in the same universe if it shares the same music? <laughs> no, it just means that we, we couldn't afford to make any more music. <laughs> 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 well, it's it's not it's not a bad song choice. If if I was driving around for for uh, Ding Dong Doofus, I'd be listening to that song as well. So. <laughs> yeah. Aquadong side pieces and Plantasm not only was about getting the band back together in terms of of like the characters, but also in terms of your production team because you mm -hmm. had not only the same voice talent, but also you know animation mm -hmm. editors, all sorts of you all just came back together to make this. I was wondering which band would you like to see get back together of band members that are all still alive? Oh, wow. Um, that's a hard call. Um, it'd be fun to like 
reanimate some people and put ACDC back together. Same with Van Halen. Those are great bands that I love. And I'm really stuck in that rock and roll 80s stuff. Yeah. Other than that, nobody else. They can just... Nobody else. <laughs> they can they just... all need to stay. They need to <laughs> yeah. stay broken up. <laughs> yeah. So on the podcast, I recently covered... At the end of 2003, Adult Swim had a, uh, a series of bumps on uh, New Year's Eve called Bashington's New Year's Eve Party. There is a moment in, in those bumps where there is a character named Boxcar Burt, who is played by Don Kennedy. It's actually like a live action guy. And he introduces a segment of you just shredding guitar. And I believe it's at a, a Donald Hubbard gig. And uh, you're just going to town. And I reached out to Barry Mills at one point and asked if there'd ever be a reunion. He said, it's, it's not impossible. I want to get your take on that. Yeah, it's not impossible. We're all still in the same general area here. Um, <clears throat> it was easy to put that band together because we all had the same goal, which was just to have fun, rock out, and make stupid music. <laughs> Yeah, that was a fun time. And uh, yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember that bump, but um, I, I think I'm, and then, you know, Dave and I put together that band for an end of a Space Ghost episode where it was Colonial Man and and, and I was the vampire and our, our drummer for Donald Hubbard was playing the drums in that band. And yeah, Barry Mills was the bouncer. He sang for our band. But yes, uh, it would be fun playing live in a band is, is just, it's, it's a blast. It's such a rush. And of course, not only did you guys play live, but you also recorded music that ended up in Aqua Teen and C-Lab, mm -hmm. uh, a few other shows too. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for you about two rumored Scrapped episodes. There is the rumored episode Circuit Attack. Does that ring any bells? No, it doesn't. What's it about? I've never heard of Circuit Attack. I, I, I don't know about Circuit Attack. All, all I've seen is an, it's rumored that someone just gave a name. Obviously, I... Didn't really expect it to be true, but I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Um, one. Otherwise, uh, there's a season 11 episode called Laser Cowboy, which was supposed to be like live action. Well, Laser Cowboy was a live action thing that I wanted to do for digital back in the, like 2014 era or something or 15. And um, it, it never got put pushed through. And then I was talking to Dave about it. And then he and I came up with this idea for Laser Cowboy cyber uh what's it called cybernetic initiative and um and so we wanted to produce it i think for like an extra it was never going to be an episode it was gonna be a live action extra for something but we didn't get to produce it probably because of timing and budget but it's still hanging around in our in our cave of ideas so it's still something that may come to fruition in the near future gotcha okay cool cool yeah yeah so moving on to production of the show when I, I had uh, Jay Edwards on the podcast. Jay was our first editor. He came over. He quit his job to come work for us. And man, the guy was like a maniac editor. He was so great. Dedication from Jay. Yeah. But when I, I asked him kind of, because I know he likes monsters and stuff. I was like, oh, did you try and work on the more monster of the week episodes? And he said that you and, and Dave would just kind of pass scripts out. So like to the editors. So I'm wondering how did you and Dave decide which editor would get which script? Um, you know, sometimes we have a script that we feel like fits a certain editor's style. Um, probably back in the beginning, we just gave it to the editor because he was the editor. And then when they were done, they got the third script. So it was sort of like a trade-off. Um, but yes, um, <clears throat> in fact, even for the movie, we pulled in four or five of our editors and we sectioned the movie out based on what was going on in the movie. And be like, Jay would be great for this part. John will nail this. Ned will nail this. Um, yeah, so the personalities are, they can be a big factor on what script they get. I mean, they all have great personalities, but sometimes something's more action-oriented or something's more monster-oriented. And uh, we try to appropriate that to the, to the person that we think will do it the best justice. I think on the Volume 2 disc, there is a special feature with just a ton of... Um just drawings and concept art for the show. 
And in it, we see storyboards for the Rabot episode. I know you guys didn't normally storyboard, but it looked like at the beginning you, you tried to just to get a grasp on something that wasn't Space Ghost because it was so different. And in that storyboard for Rabot, there is a part where Space Ghost shows up and destroys the Rabot. We storyboarded that because we were Dave and I were just left on our own to make this thing. And so we were trying everything. The storyboard almost got it killed because we turned it in. <laughs> and by the time we by the time we filmed it with a VHS camera and edited it, it was so washed out and bad. But uh yeah, Space Ghost was um he was gonna come back and kill Rabot. He was at one point, is he still in the beginning of that? He was in the very beginning with Dr. No, Weird. He was, I, I know he was supposed to be, but no, he's yeah, not. He's not. He was totally in the very beginning with Dr. Weird, egging Dr. Weird on to mess with the rabbit. <laughs> so the rabbit would get mad. Yeah. So, but we um of course didn't use that stuff, but yeah, clearly he was he was part of that at one point. Right. Yeah, because there's there's also a point where the Aqua Teens were supposed to watch TV and Space Ghost was going to be on TV as well. Then he was going to yep. show up in the episode and I mean, ultimately, obviously, I think it was a good call to not involve Space Ghost and let the mm -hmm. Aqua Teens kind of stand on their own. Plus, the idea of the Aqua Teens not actually defeating the Rabot, it's still just downtown destroying everything while they're <laughs> just chilling out at the pool is like, it sets the yeah. tone of the show to come, you know, that they don't actually solve problems. Yeah. Um, as opposed to if Space Ghost did, it's like way different than the show. Exactly, itself, exactly. And I think that, uh, I don't know if you've heard this rumor, but I'd like to nip this one in the bud, but Aqua Teen is not a spinoff from Space Ghost. Right. Right, right. It never right, was. Right, yeah. And I've, mm -hmm. I've seen it reported that way. And it's, it's totally its own thing. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like a spinoff from a from a script that got rejected, but it's not like a real spinoff, something like the Brack show where like the totally. characters were actually in space. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there is footage of you and Dave writing the cloning on the volume three DVD. You guys have uh, at first the camera's on a tripod, then Nick Inkatanawat shows up and starts filming you guys while you are writing this, this episode. And I kind of have a lot of questions about this. First of all, in that uh, footage, you had two cats. Do you still have cats? I have one of the two cats still. Really? Wow. I assume the kitten, the kitten in that video. Yeah, the orange one. He's still around. He's, he's, uh, he's 22 years old. Oh my goodness. I know. He's been in Aqua Teen. He's been in 12 Ounce Mouse. He's been in... A, a bit we did for a comic-con um uh thing and uh but yeah sadly the the tabby passed away in 2017 and she was mm. she was 18 so the orange one's still here wow okay wow i wasn't expecting that no <laughs> and his awesome. name is roger he's uh yeah he's all right he doesn't even know he's been okay. on tv three times <laughs> He was screaming his head off in, in that video. He's just yelling at you guys while you're trying to work on the script. So and he funny. still does today. <laughs> <laughs> Old habits die hard. That's so funny. You, you saw that. Yeah. So in that footage, you guys, you what, what shocked me is you came in and sat down and you just started writing the episode from the first line, really. You just wrote it as it went on. You didn't come in with an outline. You didn't come in with a, hey, I have an idea. What if they clone TVs or something? You kind of like were writing it on the fly. And is that how you typically worked or did you sometimes come in with outlines or, hey, I had this idea for an episode? No, we, we just, yeah, that's how we come in. We, uh, we don't do outlines. Um, we just have ideas. You know, we kick around a few and then we think about one. And sometimes it's because it's something that happened over the weekend and we kind of twist it into our own ap episode idea. Uh, like Kidney Car was based on me actually donating my car to the Kidney Foundation. And um, Oh, wow. That's my yeah. favorite episode, by the way. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, and that car is actually Carl's car in the, in the, before we were making the pilot, we just took an actual picture of my car and then they don't. Oh, really? It up. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's, that's yeah. wild. Yeah. Whoa. So that's, it's actually a picture of my car. And, uh, I think Bob Pettit drew all the stuff on it and too wicked comes from an old lynch mob, uh, song. So, um, but yes, uh, we know. So the, I said, yes, but what I mean is no, we don't, we don't outline. I mean, these things are so short. If we can come up with, a basic through line and then we just figure out how to twist it um yeah so that's true so we do oh, just open the laptop but like on a when we get on and start a new script we usually spend an hour just talking about the business or what's going on in adult swim and then eventually we start talking about ideas and then probably within a few hours we'll have a rough at least 15 pages of something and then we beat it up for a few days and until we record it that's surprising, but I think that's kind of why the show is as unique as it is, because I don't anticipate a lot of other shows are done that way. 
I don't think so either. And uh, and I feel like we, you know, we got lucky with just Dave and I wrote down what we thought was funny. You know, we didn't have any development people reading and telling us otherwise or or offering or suggesting. Um, the only sort of authorities we had over us were legal and S&P, clearly. And they just make sure that we're kosher in the in what we're saying and showing. But so, yeah, we're real lucky. And uh, it, that's how that's how it was. For the whole run of the series and the first movie, the second movie, we had a little bit of development people asking questions based on outlines and treatments that we had to do, but we still got through and they had some good ideas that we used and we talked them out of a lot of their ideas. But uh, but yeah, we're real lucky that we're able just to sit down, write something and then go record it when we feel it's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about how, when would you decide to add in a new character? Or like a guest voice or something like how would that come about if you didn't go in already with that plan oh i think we always we mostly always have it in the plan it's like what if they don't do the dishes and the mold comes to life and becomes an annoying roommate and then we mm. that's the character um i think yeah i think we always try to incorporate that um most of the time so it's not like it just kind of takes us by surprise i think we have that going in and i will say i want to go back to the scripting stuff too it's like we do write a script pretty fast and we put down what we think is funny, but we still are real loose when we, when we go to record them. Uh, Dana brings so much to the table. I mean, we go so off script and it just, a lot of times it just makes the show even way better. Um, you know, like there's hardly <clears throat> real lines written for her because I just get in the booth and scream <laughs> stuff. And Dave will say, say this and I'll say something. And that, you know, the same with when he's doing Carl and Meatwad, he'll, he'll just go through a, a gamut of lines and then I'll throw out some stuff that's not in the, in the script. And so I think we, we build a real big, what I think is more or, of an organic database of material to put the show together with. Yeah. Um, on some of the DVDs, we do get the original scripts for the episode. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, I'll go through and, and tell the audience like, oh, well, originally they were supposed to say this, but they changed it. You know, Shake says this instead. And, and yeah. like every single time it's way funnier, whatever is off script is like way better. So yeah, the last thing about the cloning footage of you guys writing that episode mm -hmm. at the end of it, you guys are doing a table read and Mike Lazo is in the room. And I know this wasn't typical from what I've been told is that he typically didn't like he didn't watch you guys a whole lot in the case when he did sit in for a table read. Like, was that a big deal for you guys? Were you kind of like nervous in those situations or did it? No, really matter? we weren't ever nervous. And I think that one was probably the only one that we did. We <laughs> the one time. <laughs> yeah, we don't table read. Um, Dave and I will read them to ourselves. I mean, out loud, we'll sit in a coffee shop and people are staring, looking at us because he's sounding like a little squeaky kid or a, a <laughs> roughy, whatever. Uh, no. So we, we never table read. If we did that, it was just it was just for show. OK, gotcha. Yeah. on to the finished the cloning episode on that one credited is Todd Malero. I assume that's your brother or somebody you are related to. That's my cousin. He lives in Nebraska. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. And he had something very special to do with that episode. So that's interesting. Yeah, I forgot about that actually. Wow, you're going, you're digging deep. You know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's in the credits, so I, I just typed in you know his name. I'm like, oh, does he act as well? Like what's going on? And and I, a LinkedIn page popped up and I'm like, well, it's a pretty uncommon name. It's probably him. And I was like, do I reach out and say, hey, do you want to talk about Aqua Teen? I decided not to because I didn't want to seem like I was stalking your family members. But uh, yeah, it was like really interesting how you uh, brought your cousin in there. You know, he's a you should you should reach out to him and see if he wants to do it. He's a cool, funny guy. He's a goofball. So he's a landscape architect. And so I'm sure he right. would enjoy yeah, talk, saw, yeah. Yeah, talking about the goofiness. I don't know how much he'll know. So that might make for an interesting Aqua Teen podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, yeah, I'll definitely uh, definitely reach out to him because that would Do be it. really cool i yeah. I, just, I assume because he's credited as like an actor on that one does he just do like the la 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 sounds because yeah, like exactly. me okay me was, yeah okay that's what i thought in early interviews like back in the early 2000s you and dave kind of talked about how you might give the aqua teens a neighbor on the other side the opposite side of carl but obviously you didn't really end up doing that did you guys seriously entertain that idea or or not yeah, I think we did. And I remember that um, it was, we were toying around with it being Schooly D. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been awesome. I know, I know. Um, and I don't know why we ended up not doing it. I felt, I think we felt like it 
added it just complicated it a little more you know we already have three against one so that was working um yeah so at the time i remember specifically it was going to be schooling yeah that would explain why he's always narrating their life because he literally lives <laughs> next door to them <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So obviously we touched on you handling the sound mix aspect of the show, or at least being involved in it. In an episode of Aqua Teen, after the theme song, there is usually a little sound effect before the episode starts. Are you the one that would choose those? Uh, sometimes. I think we would just, sometimes I would say, what if it were this? And then we'd agree. And sometimes it, it was just, you know, different. It was either me or Dave. And then we would just agree on what it, would, what it should be. Sometimes it was our sound designer. What if, you know, it's like, yeah, that's funny. And they were like, yeah, I like it too. So it would stay. I want to touch on the special features a little bit, because a lot of my favorite things about Aqua Teen are the special features you guys have included, most notably the the Terror Phone series. I, I talked to Jay a little bit how the first Terror Phone, he mentions how last minute that all was. You guys put it together like really last minute. And uh, I was wondering if you could talk to Terror Phone 2 and 3, like how did how you guys went about writing those? Are there any particular stories about writing the Terraphone short films? I think we wrote those just like we write uh, episodes. You know, we break the fourth wall in one of them, and then um, then we go cellular. Um, we just we wrote them. We approached them like we do Aqua Teen because it was basically an Aqua Teen tone, and uh, they were super fun to write. They were super fun to shoot. We had just had a blast, and I really to this day those things are just cracked me up and i can't remember is it two <clears throat> where dave and i do the theme song we do the end credit song and it goes on for like five minutes that's all three of them they all have like a, yeah their own but song. one of them was like it, it it was real led zeppelin sounding and i'm playing that clean guitar and uh th that's super funny to me too and we keep repeating the credits <laughs> <laughs> yeah your, your your guys's names over and over again yeah, yeah and yeah. they usually were last minute because it wasn't a lot of money behind those things everybody worked for basically well for the lunch we provided them basically so everybody was just run and gun i think we shot them in a day or two at the most you know and then there's also uh radon is radon yes. on one of them <laughs> yes radon yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, whenever I watch those, because they're just so funny, it just makes me so sad that all you guys, like the Aqua Teen crew, didn't get to make like a live action sketch show. I think that would have been incredible. And it would have been like, yeah, so bummed that you guys didn't get to do that. It's like fuck, man, that would have been great. That would have been great. Yeah, do both. You know, the, the the show and then and these little live action sketch things. It's so much fun shooting stuff like that because even in the shoot, it's like we'll we'll make stuff up during it you know and it just works mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. right yeah I, I i don't want to quote too much of your own stuff back to you but i just love in radon when you're standing there with the flashlight then you stick it in the hole you're like yeah that's a hole right there <laughs> like it's just like the funniest most random like off the top of your head shit almost we just made that up i don't even think we scripted that i think we just had an idea for it um if there was a script it was it was probably a page long so <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. of course of course you have uh dave and, and and mary craft they're polishing like just a ass load of guns they have all in their kitchen just polishing all those them. are all so my guns fun. i have a huge airsoft really? collection yeah oh okay wow that's huge that's awesome. yeah i bought them back when they didn't have to have the red muzzles on them yeah that's why i, I didn't know they were airsoft guns yeah I, mean, I, I thought they were just prop guns or something i didn't know that they were actually <laughs> yeah and the whole thing with the hot dogs and you know this is so silly <laughs> <laughs> and then the blood that effect at the end is so so yeah, dumb yeah. but it but yeah. it's it works yeah yeah okay so so speaking of of, of those uh in in terraphone three there's a part when you and dave are inside this building eating like your nice lunch while everyone else is outside eating tortillas <laughs> and ketchup yeah and you're talking to dave and you mentioned how you uh you worked on hellraiser three which i love I love that you're telling him that, like, obviously, he already knew that in real life at that point, but you're, like, repeating it back to him. I have a pretty cool Hellraiser connection uh, for you uh, between Aqua Teen and Hellraiser. So, in the season two episode, The Cubing, there is an Atlanta college band who are credited on, like, sound design for that episode called the Moon Knights. I don't know if that rings any bells, the but they were, they were, yeah, they were called the Moon Knights, and one of the guys in the Moon Knights was a guy by, by the name of Ben Collins, and he went on to write the new Hellraiser film. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so that's cool. I, I don't recall that band doing... I don't know what they did. Um, I think it was literally... 
I haven't talked to Ben that much. I talked to him like once, like really okay. quickly. Mm -hmm. I want to get him on the podcast to find out more because it is kind of a big question. Like, how did they get involved? I, I you know, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, they are in the credits on that episode. Interesting. And um, it, it's 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 just like a droning sound effect as one of as uh, the Wisdom Cube played by Brian Posehn comes down from the sky. No, the Wisdom Cube was that was John Schnapp. That's like the first one, but then like the the real Wisdom Cube comes oh, down. Oh right, from the sky, yeah, who's, yeah, yeah. Who's then played by? Yeah, yeah. So there's like a sound effect. I think that's what they contributed was that sound effect that you guys use. But yeah, he went on to co-write the new Hellraiser film. Wow, that's really great. Yeah, I worked on the number. I worked on the third one, which isn't very good, but um, I had a blast oh, I, working on it. I think it's good. I think a lot of the fans like it too. That's one of the higher rated ones. It is. Well, I was just happy to work on it. I mean, I was hanging out with Pinhead and stuff, and it was super fun. And I was such a fan of the first two. That was sort of my. Uh, I would seek out sequels to horror movies I loved and tried to work on them. So while I was before, so right before Hellraiser three started, I I did pick up work on Children of the Corn two because it was the same studio. Yeah, and same thing with the other films. A lot of them I just kind of like either fell into them or I tried to get on them on purpose because I'd seen Basket Case. I wanted to work on Basket Case three. <laughs> <laughs> and this period for you, because I know you worked at Turner like in the mail room. Then I think my understanding is you left, you went and did that stuff on movies. Then you got called back to Turner. Is that correct? To work on Space Ghost? Uh, sort of. I, <clears throat> I got a job there working in programming. Um, and that's where I met Mike Lazo. Lazo was the one who worked in the mail room and moved his way up. Oh, so okay. I, my job was, it was, this was in 88 and, uh, Lazo was basically a secretary and I was answering viewer mail, uh, part-time and, and Lazo and I hit it off. And then, <clears throat> yes, and I left and went freelance and did a bunch of stuff. And then when I came back, I'd also met Keith Crawford through Mike Lazo back in 88. And he was in the film business. I got into the film business. And then they called me because Lazo knew I was like a silly writer. I like these, I was writing stuff and we were goofing off all the time. And he said, we're trying to put this talk show together. You want to come over and help us? And Keith was involved. And so, yeah, that's how, that's how that sort of started right there. The Space Ghost. Uh, saga was me and Keith and Mike and then Kathy Jones and Andy Merrill. I don't want to leave Hellraiser yet. I want you to tell me about working on Hellraiser. I, I heard in an interview that you uh, worked in like whatever unit you were on was the one with the like Cenobites really. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? So do you have like any yeah. stories about that? That sounds so fascinating. It was just it was just so much fun. I was like living it. So when I first started working on that movie, I was a set PA. And within like three days, they realized they had so much second unit work to do with the Cenobites and the effects um, that I got pulled over to first AD, the second unit. We were called the love unit, even though it was just filled with blood. Um, but it, I mean, it was like, I'd, I'd come in at three in the morning because I wanted to watch Doug Bradley start getting put together as pinhead. We weren't shooting until eight, you know, there, there were some shots where, and I'm sure I wasn't, but I did think of this and said, they wanted these chains to like come in and wrap around these, these door handles. It's like, why don't you just put the chains on there and pull them off and then we'll just roll it back in reverse. And, and we did it that way. And I mean, it was just a bloodbath. It was like just mixing. I remember Halloween night, I was working on that movie and we were mixing 50 barrel, 50 gallon barrel drums of blood because everybody gets killed in this club and we show all this blood coming out underneath the doors. And um, it was just a true i got i got to work with bob Keane. he was the original effects guy on the first two hellraisers actually have one of the original boxes um on display next to my space 1999 eagles <laughs> uh so the stories are just nothing crazy or super i mean it was just so exciting to be around this because that's kind of what i wanted to do when i was like eight it's like i'm gonna do makeup effects for movies um and just watching this come to life on a film that i loved um was so much fun and we were right we were shooting it right in the middle of north carolina like the bible belt so everybody wanted to stay way under the radar about what we were doing <laughs> and we stole a lot of shots we ran around stole shots in greensboro and and uh, all over the place so it was, it was almost in a way guerrilla filmmaking but i was working with these i was hanging out with the cenobites i mean that's great right it's insane yeah I'm curious because I know you like metal music. I don't know specifically what kind of metal music, but I was mm -hmm. wondering if you like the band Cradle of Filth. Uh, I'm not so into them. Uh, I mean, just because I don't not like them, I just don't like play them, you know? Um, I like things where I can normally understand the lyrics. Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. 
Well, I, I ask because Doug Bradley does a lot of narration on their albums and a lot of vocal work on their stuff. So that's why I was just wondering. Oh, interesting. Maybe... I didn't know that, yeah. you know. That's how I got into Hellraiser because I grew up loving Cradle of Filth and I'm like, oh, who's this guy narrating these songs? And I look him up. I'm like, oh, he, he's in these Hellraiser movies. So I'm like 13 asking my mom to get me all these Hellraiser movies and like Nightbreed and stuff. And she'd get them for me. We'd watch them together. But yeah, that's how I got into that. Oh, that's interesting. I guess uh, I guess I was more of a fan of the character Pinhead than I didn't really follow Doug Bradley, you know? Sure. OK, yeah, that makes, yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so I have a, just a couple of things. That, these aren't even questions. I just want to tell you about Aqua Teen, similar to the uh, Hellraiser connection here. Yeah. So I know you're a horror movie fan, and mm -hmm. it, it's it's documented pretty publicly how, obviously, Aqua Teen was in, like, Breaking Bad. There's a shot of Aqua Teen on the TV in Breaking Bad. Same with The Sopranos. I was wondering if you knew that in the film The Ring, there is a deleted scene where Aqua Teen is featured pretty heavily. I know about that because Dave and I were working on Aqua Teen when the PR lady came in and said there's a movie that wants to license a clip from your show. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Of course, we just didn't care what movie it was. And she said, it's about a haunted vi videotape. <laughs> so we, got, <laughs> we made fun of that so much. Um, right. But yes, I have to do, I've seen the deleted scene. It's a Dr. Weird scene and the little, the little boys watching it. And, and it's showcased quite a bit in the deleted scene. It is, yeah, it's really heavily featured. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. insane. Yeah, I, th I think it's Rabot is what they're watching. It is, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it, it's not like a quick shot. It is like you hear a lot of the audio. They're they're sitting there watching it. It's pretty yeah. cool. So the next thing I want to tell you is uh, in the Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters, mm -hmm. you guys worked with an Atlanta acapella group for that, uh, oh. you know, that uh, movie time song, that groovy time for a movie time song. Yeah. And a woman in that group uh, is, is Susan Bennett, and she went on to be the first voice of Siri. Yes, I know that. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that interesting? It was, because of, <laughs> yeah, it was because of the work she did for us. That yeah, that's that what I read, game. is that they were so impressed yeah. by her work on that song that she got a... Uh... What are these rules? Remember to keep your shoes on at all times. Don't pull your penis out unless you really need to. Indecent exposure is a class two felony. They were, they were the whole, the whole tone of that open just fit Apple perfectly. And they said, this is, we want to be associated with Mastodon <laughs> and Susan Bennett. <laughs> yeah. They were going to use that Mastodon song. I heard as the first ringtone, but they, you know, it got voted out, I guess. Unfortunate. <laughs> That song, I have to say, that song was so much fun to record. So as like all the music Dave and I do, we write all the lyrics. And then Mastodon agreed to come in and do it. They had barely even practiced it. We did that whole song in one day, and they were so much fun to work with. And they were trying to fit our stupid lyrics into the rhythm of their, and they managed to do it. And it's, uh, it's honestly one of my favorite parts of that movie is that open. Oh, me too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, growing up, I was 13 when the movie came out. I was a metal kid. So when I saw that, I was like, holy fuck, man. This is like so <laughs> yeah. cool. Those guys live here. You know, I, occasionally the other day I texted Britt and said, you guys should uh, do a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, Matt. Yeah, sure, sure. That'll be on the next album. <laughs> you guys did, you know, because I, I saw there is footage of you guys in the in the booth, really, with them. Or not in the booth, but in the studio, mm -hmm. working with them on that. Same with the acapella group. You also worked with Cameo for footage mm -hmm. for the film. And you guys, I saw you guys sitting there while they wrote that song but that did not make it to the film can you tell me why that didn't make it into the film because you you animated it and everything we did we we animated it and we, it was in the uh, and i think it was actually in the first screening that we had when we had like a uh uh focus group with it and um it just that that movie was long and we felt like that just kind of just we like things that come out of nowhere but i felt like it was too much and it, sh it helped shorten the movie get it faster but they yeah it was it was kind of neat hanging out with them and uh watching them do their thing i mean it sounds just like every other song they do but it was it was so <laughs> <laughs> it was so aqua teen you know <laughs> and uh but yeah 
So, you know, we had a lot of deleted scenes from the first movie because we just kept pumping out material. As with Plantasm, we, we were on such a tight schedule and we actually storyboarded it. We don't have a lot of deleted scenes. And the deleted scenes that are on the DVD, I think, are like a second, second and a half long. But I, I think that uh, Cameo still to this day remembers how great it was to work with us. I think they do because they actually <laughs> uploaded them working on that with you to their YouTube channel. Like they have two clips or two videos of them doing that song. And I played guitar. I played guitar for it too. Um, it, um, at the end, when it's kind of trailing off, I'm like wailing on the guitar. And I remember they were like, "Hey, you need to come on tour with us." And I was like, "That'd be cool. I'd go on tour with Cameo." <laughs> Oh, but I think they were just teasing me. <laughs> right. <laughs> they'd, they'd have you play that one song and then you could sit back and watch them play Word Up. <clears throat> yeah. I had to wear a yellow cod piece. I was like, no, I'm wearing the red one. <laughs> that's, that's why they wouldn't take you because they're mm -hmm. like, no, no, only I get to wear the red. It was a wardrobe dispute that led to our falling out. <laughs> Hey, it's Ronnie cutting in here, just hoping that you are enjoying this interview. I mean, if you're still listening, I suspect that you are. And I just want to let you know that I have other interviews with other people who worked on the show, such as Dave Willis, MC Chris, Jay Edwards, Nick Gibbons. And coming in 2023, we will be getting a lot more people who worked on Aqua Teen on the podcast. So I hope you're looking forward to that. If you're not already following this podcast or subscribe to it, don't worry. Are you on Spotify? Because if you are, guess what? You can follow the podcast on there. If you're on Apple Podcasts, don't worry. Got you covered. I submitted there too. I'm locked and loaded, ready for you there. You can listen to the podcast on dancingisforbidden.com or, you know, I guess wherever else you get podcasts, right? That's how a podcast really works, I think. So, hey, all sorts of options for you for your fast-paced lifestyle. I hope you can work it into your schedule. When we're not interviewing people on the show, we are normally deep diving through episodes of the show, finding all sorts of facts and information about the episodes, trying to squeeze out as much trivia as we can out of every single Aqua Teen episode, and also getting help from people who worked on the show as well. So you might hear some information from Dana Snyder or Jay Edwards or, or whoever we need to contact to get the answers we crave. But it's not all serious business, you know, we're partying at the same time, listening back to the episodes, laughing, having a good time, reminiscing, loving the best show of all time. I think so anyways. If you're still listening this far in the interview, then I suspect that you will like the other episodes that we've got going on. Check it out, you might dig it, and uh, do me a favor though, don't check out like the first one or something because that one probably sucks. But alright, I think it's time we jump back in this, this interview, I am craving more Matt Malero in my life. Let's go get some of it. Let's talk to Matt about Carl's original voice actor. Hmm, that sounds interesting. I have a question. I've heard, it might have been Ned mentioned that there was originally going to be somebody else voicing Carl. Can you speak to that? That's true. We auditioned a few local people. And at the time, we some of the people weren't even doing that gruff Jersey you know, accent and... Uh, it just made sense that Dave do it because he had been doing it for Space Ghost. He was Space Ghost's neighbor. His name was Vincent or something or Vinny. Um, so we just went with Dave. So yes, there was. And you know, there was also a different pilot. Oh, really? I didn't, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. The pilot was a, a guy. Some, he was a truck driver, but he also did voiceover and he voiced Frylock. And I can't remember if we redid it with Carrie, but the original pilot that aired had this different Frylock voice in it. Oh, so, okay. Gotcha. Well, the original one that aired is Carrie, but this must have been... Then we redid early. it. Or, yeah, or we redid it before it aired because originally it was Andrew somebody. Really nice dude. Um, but then Carrie came in and just did a better job. Sure, sure. Wow, yeah. I didn't... I, I don't think I knew that. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and you know, the backgrounds in the pilot is... They're totally different. John Schnepp did those. Right. Yeah, and a lot of them are, are, are ripped from uh, other shows and stuff, too. Because we didn't have any money, like we had the Powerpuff Mall in there, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've heard uh, Bob Pettit. This it was like the bane of his existence because he worked so hard 
on backgrounds for you guys later on and people just assumed they were from other shows and he's like no i'm i made these for aqua and like they're not from something else oh that's too bad bob's background work i mean bob is an amazing guy such a talent his his backgrounds are just they'll blow you away you know he works so hard on those things and and they and they really it really shows yeah uh, it was really interesting um i i haven't spoken to him i would like to but i i haven't but i heard him in an interview talking about how uh, the backgrounds were meant to be kind of like a straight man to the crazy looking characters. So the backgrounds are, you know, pretty realistic and and nothing too crazy looking. Um, but there's a lot of fun details in them, which is like kind of what my podcast does is look look for all those details. But they're, you know, they're not overtly wild while these characters are these food products on the screen there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have, I have a couple of fan questions here for you. First, a fan question from me. And I asked this to Dave as well. Because you guys have featured Rush so heavily throughout your work and you had the late, great Neil Peart in the 2007 film, what is your favorite Rush album? Probably 2112. I actually have that album. Nice. That's, that's mine too. Yeah. <laughs> So I was in a band in high school and uh, my drummer was obviously a Rush fan. So that's how I even got. But I think, I think we gravitated to Rush, not so much because we love their music, even though we do like their music, but we just saw their album covers as so ridiculous and silly. And it's like, they only sing songs about, they don't sing songs about girls and partying. It's all about the trees and the grasses <laughs> and the chemicals. And it's like, <laughs> so I think that's why we like to include them because we're kind of making fun of them, even though we totally respect them. And it was so right. much fun to have Neil Pert. I remember Neil Pert or Peart. <clears throat> we got in touch with him. We actually got to talk to him and we told him what we wanted. And he's like, okay. He's like, I'll call you back. You know, so like a few hours later, he calls me back and he plays me the solo over speakerphone. And he's like, how's that? And I'm like, <laughs> What am I supposed to say? Well, <laughs> no, Neil, no, Neil. Know, man, I think uh, <laughs> your timing's a little off. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it another pass. So it was cool. I got to actually interact with him uh, for that movie, like him personally. So that was fun. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in case you're curious, Dave said Power Windows was his favorite. Really? I didn't know that it was, that was even an album. I really, I don't, <laughs> I don't follow them. <laughs> it's one of their it's one of their synthier albums, so I, I understand why you wouldn't be as as into it. Yeah, but come on, the priestess syrinx. I mean, that's like a blow your head off. Yeah, yeah that that whole that whole side of that album is just yeah. incredible. Um, plus the pic the picture inside is them wearing like kimonos or something like that, standing there looking all serious with these kimonos on. It's <laughs> yeah. so funny. Um, okay, so so Ian over at CorndogCentral.com, you you've spoken with him. He did an interview for. Uh, for Zoo Day uh, mm -hmm. last year, I think. Yeah. Uh, he, has a he, he has a question for you. It is, um, is there anything you've always wanted to reference or do an homage to in one of your shows, but haven't been able to work it in? You know, I, th I feel like the things that inspired me to do kind of be where I am, I've been able to, I think I've been able to throw those in there, you know, some Hellraiser, some Phantasm, some of my influences with music, uh, even in relationship to what I play or who we cast. So <clears throat> right now, I don't feel like I've missed anything, but I'm, I'm not done making these or other projects. So I have the opportunity to throw that kind of stuff in there. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. I figured, you know, you've done so much stuff that <laughs> there's no, sh there was no shortage of opportunity for you to work yeah, in these references true. that you wanted to. Sam Hain wants to know, have you ever noticed how Aqua Teen's unique comedy has indirectly integrated itself into younger generations? As someone who grew up with early to mid 2000s internet, I didn't know of the show directly as a kid, but looking back, it really was a huge catalyst for a niche genre of fast-paced random humor with stuff like the random explosions and quick jokes. That's interesting. Um, I haven't. Um, I know that it wasn't long after we were doing Adult Slam that other networks were trying to kind of do the same thing. Um, but I think that we were just doing what we thought was funny, which happened to be what they're seeing and hearing about on the internet and um so no i haven't really noticed that but i do i do remember other networks trying to copy 
sort of a block of crazy stuff like what we were doing. Um, yeah. Calvin asks, what is your favorite Aqua Teen Hunger Force episode? That's a hard, no, that's not a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what are some of your favorite Aqua Teen episodes? I mean, the Moon and Nights, the first Moon and Nights is so great. I really like Styrons. I mean, there's so many just really standout ones to me that there's too many. I mean, I really like them all. I mean, we wouldn't do them. We wouldn't produce them in air if we didn't like them. So it's, it's really hard to to pick one answer for that because there would be dozens. How many do we make? A hundred and something? It would be a hundred and something. Almost 140. Even number 100 was great. I mean, uh, we got Tom Savini's in that one. You know, it's like we had fun time working on all those things. I, I like them all. Uh, I was going to surprise you with a question from your buddy, Ben Prisk, but he unfortunately didn't get back to me yet. So we'll have to uh, oh, wait and see if he responds. I met Ben in through my friend Chad who I went to film school with and Ben was a local artist and uh, we just kind of, he, he, <clears throat> he did a poster for me. I wrote this movie for Fox. It was about a Chia pet and he did the poster and um, it didn't get made, but I actually got him because Bob Pettit was originally on, on the table to do the squid Billy's backgrounds. And I was like, no, no, I have this guy. He's really good. He's so different folksy and Ben Prisk. And um, they saw his stuff and he got in. Ben's a good guy. Yeah, no, he's really, really, really nice. He, he'll answer all my questions I have for him. And his art is incredible. I, I follow him on Instagram and just like he works in all different mediums, but everything he does, I'm just sitting there like, holy shit, man. Like, how do you even think of this stuff? It's crazy. I know. I know. He's nuts. He did a painting for me for my birthday once. My wife secretly commissioned it and it's just some I can't even it's it's so outrageous and cool uh yeah he's he's awesome so I want to move on to your other work that you've done outside of Aqua Teen Postocalypse you got to tell me what you can about it throw me a bone I, I assume it's still in the works based on what you were saying yeah we're in animation right now um and, and it's the same people who did Aqua Teen, Aqua Teen movie. Right, right, right. So so that would be Bento Box Atlanta. Then, it's Bento right? Box, it's Craig Harton, Matt Jenkins, it's that whole oh, group, wow, J- okay. Jason Schwartz. Um, yeah, that is, man, that is such a fun ride. Um, I didn't even really, so Bento called me and said, Fox wants to, they own Tubi now, they want to do some movies for Tubi. I'm like, cool. It's like, let's have a call. So I'm like, okay. So I'm on the call with Fox and I know the people at Fox and then Bento's on the call. And so Fox for 15 minutes is telling me what they're thinking, what they want to do, how they want to do it. And then, you know, Bento at the time said, we're not pitching anything. We're just calling them. So, okay. So after they wound down their, um, this is what we want to do movie wise. There was just this awkward silence and Bento box wasn't saying anything. So I just launched into like this idea that I'd had, <laughs> I had no, I had no pitch for it or story. Like what if mm-hmm. noodles did this and they came to life and it was like apocalypse <laughs> and they're like, you know, marinara running red in the streets and, it's like, this is my version of The Walking Dead. They were like, the next day, like, here's the paperwork. Let's make this movie. So I had to come up with a story. Um, it's really fun. It's a journey of this mad pasta mogul and his daughter who has everything suddenly has nothing. Her dad's like wreaking havoc on the world and she has to go stop it with this team of survivors. <laughs> uh it's a blast. The, the The look is so great. The tone is so great. The voice talent is amazing. And uh, some people in there from Aqua Teen and people I've worked with before, and they really love it. So it's <clears throat> I'm, I'm doing a lot of the scoring of it myself. So it took a while to write the script and get those uh, you know approved, and we recorded, and now it's an animation. I think it comes out in April. Wow. I'm so excited for that. You know, I was afraid because... A lot of like looking at your LinkedIn, a lot of the scripts and stuff you've written, unfortunately, didn't really get made or released or whatever. So I was like so afraid you'd be like, oh, it's not happening anymore. But no, dude, it's it's so happening. Um, I, guess, I wish I had some stuff up. I, could, I would actually show you, but it wouldn't uh, translate on the podcast. But uh, yeah, it's really great. And so um, so excited about this thing. They called last week to do the sequel. So I'm deciding whether I'm going to write wow. the sequel of this other project in the movie Postocalypse. Uh, people refer to this other movie that's fake and we built a fake trailer for it. (laughs) And so, and that's such a ridiculous concept. So they're asking like, do we do the sequel or we do the other movie? It was like, Oh man, that's hard to like the sequel is like ready to go cast wise. The other movie isn't. So I'm right now I'm deciding which one to do. So I'm sure we'll do all, all of them. So we'll see. So I, yeah, you know, I, I approached a postocalypse like Sharknado, except 
the monsters in my movie are sentient and have thoughts and ideas and talk. <laughs> yeah, and that's on Tubi, you said, correct? It will be, yeah. Yeah, and that's and Tubi is free, right? Tubi, Tubi is totally free. Right, because that, that's where I watched Phantasm. All of those are on Tubi as well for free, so that's why I was watching those. Yeah, that's insane. Tubi gets more viewership than any of these streaming people because it's free. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Oh, man, I'm so excited for that. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously you can't say much about it, so thanks for telling me what you could. On to the show on Adult Swim, Metalocalypse. I've never seen you credited on that, but did you have anything to do with that whatsoever? I will say that no, I had nothing to do with the actual show, but I called, I went to Lazo one time and said, I love heavy metal. We need to make a heavy metal show. He's like, cool, call Brendan because he likes heavy metal too. So I called Brendan said, dude, we need to make a heavy metal show. He's like, yeah, it's a good idea. And then all of a sudden there's Metalocalypse. No, no. <laughs> they left you in the dust. But I'm not saying, no, he did. I had no idea. All I said no, was, I, I, no, I know, I know, I know. No, I, no, I didn't have anything to do with it. But uh, Brendan and I are uh, good email friends and we email back and forth a lot about mostly gear and guitars because he's so right, into it. Right, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for that film too. <laughs> and I know that. Mm -hmm. you thought that aqua teen was the only one actually in 4k do you know if that's still true that's true it's it's true and actually it wouldn't even be that way except they weren't going to pay for it and uh it wasn't in the budget but somehow craig harton at bento box figured out a way he was like i'm not putting a movie out in 2k it's where nobody does that in 2022 <laughs> so he made it happen so that's true wow okay that's that's yeah i mean that speaks to the power of aqua teen and the people who work on it that uh you guys could figure that out. That's so cool. Um, I want to ask you or talk to you a little bit about uh, your comic that you uh, wrote some time ago called uh, Nobody's, the cool. only comic that I that I own and also the only one I've ever read. And uh, <laughs> I was wondering, I read in an interview at the time that you don't really read comics or, or mm -hmm. you weren't really a comic book guy. So what kind of inspired you to write your own comic book? Well, um, the idea in that comic book was an idea I wanted to pitch as a movie. And at the time I had this manager at, somewhere and and we and i think i tried to maybe sell it pitch it and then uh kickstart entertainment reached out because they saw it and they said we're gonna we're making these 15 graphic novels this next year and we like this idea so i was like well that's a way to get it out there so i worked with them on it yeah so it became a graphic novel um and it's true i never really grew up reading comics or watching cartoons actually um I just uh, had other things I was doing, but <clears throat> that was really fun to put together. I think the artwork is kind of timeless in it. And I'm actually developed, I'm actually developing it right now with, with one of the producers from Kickstart. We're trying to sell it again as a hybrid. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. What I found interesting about the Nobody's comic is that the kids are not supposed to know what the parents are doing. And I was kind of wondering if you were maybe drawing on your own life because you make a, uh, adult cartoons and I assume that your kids would be like, hey, I want to see what dad works on, but they weren't able to. Is, is there maybe some parallel there? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's what I thought, but I, no. I figured that's, I'd ask. <laughs> that's probably what it should be, right? But it's not. It's... <laughs> In fact, in the original idea, the nobodies weren't even really a family. They, they figured that out later. Um, so, but in this, movie, in, this, in this story, they really are a family. But I, I was trying to draw on like, kind of a mr and mrs smith idea with true lies and but regulating the supernatural so that's kind of <clears throat> but it no it inspired yeah it had nothing to do with with what my kids think i'm doing or not doing <laughs> well when i had nick gibbons on the show we were talking a bit about because he edits from home because of yeah. covid you know how uh you know his kids would come in the room and say dad what are you working on can i see and obviously he couldn't show his kids because they were pretty young but uh I, I'm, yeah. I'm sure that you guys have probably had that parallel as well with little kids and they probably want to see your cartoons yeah you know it's just been like the last few years that my kids are 14 and 16 now um about to turn up one and then um they're, they're just now kind of checking this stuff out and not that i kept i did keep it from them when they were smaller but because it wasn't for them but now they're just looking at it it's fine it's all they they know <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that that nobody's was a way to get like kind of an unused idea out there. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider maybe publishing your unused, unmade scripts for fans to like buy and read or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I would if somebody wanted to do it. Um, 
but that's not happening right now. Somebody asked me about it, wanted to produce it. Yes. But kind of like the medium I'm in right now. Um, and I found that kind of hard to do on a comic level because there's so many rules about what can be put on a page and w- where it goes and shortening and lengthening dialogue. So, <clears throat> but no, I, I'm, but I'm proud of that book. I think it's, I think it's really good and unique and hopefully we'll get it sold somewhere as a series. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I saw in an interview, you mentioned that you wrote a third rock from the sun spec script. Mm. And it was rejected because it was too weird. I was wondering if you remembered anything about that script, like what what happened in it. I remember, I remember a little bit, but I wrote it as yeah. It's not that I tried to sell it to Third Rock from the Sun. I really wrote it as a spec to get my work out there, so people would read it and say, "Oh, this is funny. Let's talk to this guy." No matter what show it was. Um, so I'm sure it did get rejected by Third Rock. I don't know if it was ever presented to Third Rock, um, but I did like that show. Um, and I think it was called. It's something to do with three on a mat. It was about being unlucky. Oh, it was called Unlucky Dick was what it was called. So everything he did had something to do with like like lighting three cigarettes with 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 one match or the black cat as like in your frame. And uh and it just like led to his sort of downfall during the series. But yeah, that's about as much as I remember because that was so long ago. That was back when God, I was I was in LA working on MTV's first scripted show when I wrote that thing. I mean, that was like, God, when was that? Like 95 or something? Sounds, yeah, it was, yeah. Because I, I read that in a really old interview too. So I was I was wondering if you'd even remember that you did it. <laughs> yeah, no, it I remember so it, yeah. So in Aqua Teen, there are a lot of David Lynch references that mm-hmm. I assume mostly come from you. I was curious what your favorite David Lynch project is, like film or or show or whatever. Well, uh, you know, my, well, yeah, it's hard, but I think, I think my overall favorite movie is Lost Highway. Mm. I really love that movie. Um, and then I did enjoy, I never watched the original Twin Peaks, but I watched the reboot. Really? Because that's like season, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, and I loved it. thought it was great. Yeah, oh, it's really, yeah, it's great. You know, I don't have, what I like about it is like, I'm always trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out. And that heavily influenced 12 Ounce Mouse. Um, as well as a show called The Prisoner, which is an old 60s show um, that was kind of insane. Uh, but yeah, I think David Lynch is brilliant. His work is just, just, it just makes you feel a certain way in a way that no other movies to me do. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Funny, funny you mentioned Lost Highway. I'm wearing a Smashing Pumpkins shirt and they have a uh, song on that soundtrack. But yeah, that's a great soundtrack too. Just the soundtrack you put together was so of its time. And, and just really interesting on that. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I, d- I discovered Ramstein. I was like, oh, who's this band? You know, and my, I, had a, I was in Atlanta. I'd just seen the movie and my friend was in town with his German friend. He was like, oh, that's, they're all over Germany. So he called his girlfriend and they FedExed me three of their CDs. And I was just <laughs> like, this band, this band is in my face and I really like their grooves and rhythm. I don't really listen to them so much anymore. But back then it was like, to me, it was like a new sound. It was so cool. Yeah. Oh, and their live shows too are just crazy. There's so much, so much pyrotechnics and the singers doing flips around the stage with flames going on. Yeah, everywhere. I've seen that stuff on on YouTube. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> I have some rapid fire questions for you before I get to those. The last thing I want to talk about really is your history as a guitar player because I play guitar as well. Cool. I'm wondering at what age did you start playing? I started playing probably when I was in sixth, fifth or sixth grade. My dad had a my dad didn't play. He just happened to have this crappy Mexican acoustic guitar. And, and it was so hard to play because it wasn't a good one. And, and I just wanted to play it. And I took, I took standard lessons where they were teaching you the chords and, and, I, and I hated doing that. And eventually it was just hard because I didn't know how to do it. Eventually, um, you know, I think it was in high school, maybe freshman year, I started taking guitar lessons from a guy who would just come over and say, what do you want to learn? And I'd play an album. He'd figure it out and show it to me. And then that's when I first got my first electric and my mom bought me my first amp, which I still have. Yeah. So, and I was influenced by those, you know, eighties, it was like Ozzy and Van Halen and Black Sabbath and um, everybody wanted to figure out eruption. And 
So, so that's how I started and uh, just kept going because I just love doing it so much. Do you remember your first guitar that like was yours, like that you bought? Uh, no, but I remember the first guitar that my mom bought for me. It's this Hagstrom. Oh, wow. You still got it? Oh, looks nice. It. Yeah, it's in good shape. Like, what does your practice routine look like now, if you even have one anymore do you try and play a certain amount every day or no but i i always have it I always play something i've been i discovered these new plugins that i love and so i've been so it makes me want to play more so i usually play in between just working down here on my own on a script or on a show or i'll even pick it up and do around when dave and i are about to work and um so i don't have a routine and so not only do i have them downstairs they're upstairs too and my kids play them so they're just kind of all oh, over nice. the place so we're always so there's cool. always a guitar sound going on in the house somewhere mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, growing up, my dad uh, was a, a, a gigging musician, so our oh. front room was just filled with, you know, cabs and just everything yeah. I could want. Mm-hmm. Um, then, of course, once I move out on my own, I have just <laughs> two guitars now and, and no amps. I just play it all right in the computer. But when we were making the movie Aqua Teen Colon, um, I'd done so much music for the show and everything, and uh, I went to our production manager and said, "Dude." I'm about to, I, I had to redo this Bill Collins song because it was too expensive for us to do <laughs> in the air tonight. I said, I want, I want something. You're not paying me extra to do this. So he gave me his credit card and I went out and bought this Mesa Boogie dual rectifier with the original cabinet. And nice. I, I just walked in there and said, I'll take that and that. And they threw it in my truck and I paid for it and left. It was so insane to have done that. It was like $5,000 worth of guitar mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, th- well. Thanks for humoring my gear talk. I just have a couple. Look uh, at this one. Oh, you got you got more Can for you... me. Oh, Matt is he's turning his phone around and showing me his desktop. Can you read that? Uh no, I can't see the whole thing yet. It says Nunderworld. Nunderworld. I have a pilot with Swim called Nunderworld. Oh, really? Yeah. It's can about I, a, can we talk it, about this on the podcast? <clears throat> it's about a possessed. Well, we haven't approved any of it i mean it's, it's been bought and sold and everything when we're trying to get it to pilot mm-hmm. uh yeah it's about it's sort of it's a grindhouse horror comedy about a slightly possessed nun who roams arizona in her 76 firebird taking out <laughs> with a stained glass front window she takes out bad guys i'm writing it with ryan gilmore who's a super funny dude in la and we've had a lot of projects together uh-huh. uh alex party did all the design it's so fucked up. It's oh, really man, good. I'm so excited. Yeah. Is this kind of is this kind of like you uh, being able to do something new, kind of in the vein of of stiff that uh, you weren't able to? Oh uh, yeah, before. kind of. And also, it pulls in a lot of the dark horror elements that I like. And, and 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 Ryan and I are both big horror fans, and he likes more the even the Black Christmases more than me. But we're, we still gravitate that way. And so this was a way to make something what i think is unique for the animation world it's it's not just haha comedy there's a lot of like effed up stuff in it you know oh, i'm so excited for that too yeah okay so let me just ask you uh your favorite band and or album um yeah i just have to go back to my roots i think i think van halen one is is an amazing album musically And uh, I really liked Eddie's style. He was a huge influence on me. Not to say I like other, I, I still like other people. And there's more, you know, there was a point like with 12 Ounce Mouse where I got so, I needed a new theme song for season three. And I was so tired of all the metal that was out there. I started searching for female driven vocalists. And that's how I discovered Amaranth. So there's a lot of their music I like too. But ultimately, I'd say even to, to today, I listen to Van Halen 1. Favorite, well, we, we know your favorite film is, is Phantasm, correct? Yeah. Um, what about TV show? Uh, if I had to pick a TV show, I don't watch much TV, but uh, <clears throat> Millennium. I love Millennium. Lance Henriksen. It was a Chris Carter thing. It, he did X-Files, obviously, and then his other thing was Millennium. It was very, uh, it's a very dark show. I loved it. And then also USA's, USA's run of um, La Femme Nikita. I really like that one, too. 
So I don't buy much. I don't, I don't watch much TV. Um, in fact, I don't watch any TV really, uh, but I did own those DVDs and binge watched them, but that was a while ago. Do you have a favorite book? The Bible. I mean, the Bible is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really? You're, you're reading that uh, a passage before bed every night? Yeah. I had to read one before I got on with you to make sure I was in the, you know, <laughs> spiritually put together. When, 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 when the technicals weren't working, you opened up the Bible and you started <laughs> yeah. asking God, yeah. what do I do? How do I get this Zencaster shit to work? Oh man. I mean, I mean, there's so, there's so many books, right? There's gotta be dozens of books um, that have been published. I think there's a few of them. <laughs> There's a couple that you could choose from. Fear and Loathing was a favorite when I was when I was younger. But I would say, yes, the Bible or the Georgia Driver's Manual is one of my favorite <laughs> Those books. Those are the most useful uh, books. And it always life. surprises me. It, it's like, even though I've read it, it's like it's still fresh and new. <laughs> it's a timeless <laughs> classic. It is. <laughs> so since you work on a show about talking fast food products, I'm wondering what your favorite fast food joint is. Boy, man, it's like, I think Chick-fil-A is really good. Um, But when I go camping at this one place, there's an Arby's right there. And I always go get one of their sandwiches. And I know it's not real. It's not real meat. I think the bread might be real. Hopefully. But God, it is delicious. (laughs) (laughs) All right, man. So there you have it. My my conversation with Matt Malero. And I think that this is actually the only one-on-one podcast he's ever done. Uh, A couple years ago, he did some stuff with Mary Spender for 12 Ounce Mouse. He did some interviews like with her at his side. And then uh, I know he's been interviewed like at Comic-Con and stuff with with, like a bunch of other people there. But I think this is his only one-on-one thing about Aqua Teen. So just such an honor, man. I can't believe that. I never thought he would come on the podcast simply because he just doesn't really do podcasts. So this is just wild. I didn't expect it to happen again. Thank you so much to Dave. Matt was so fun to talk to. And I know I said this about everybody. I probably sound like a broken record, but there's no, there's no other way to put it. These guys are all just so, so cool. And so, so nice. And, and it makes me love this show so much more. It's important that you know that, that you know how awesome these creators are They They don't take for granted like this fandom. They really appreciate all of us. And they just want to keep making good stuff for us. So, you know, on that note, to facilitate that, if you haven't already bought Plantasm, please do. And you can also buy it via the links in the show notes, which will take you to Amazon. You can buy the 4K, the Blu-ray, or the digital version. And at no extra cost to you, a few dollars will be kicked back to the podcast off of your purchase. So if you want to support the podcast and pick up a copy of, of Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm, definitely do it. Some great special features on there, a music video for the Run the Jewels song, and it is so great. It's awesome. It's one of my favorite things that they've ever done. I'm actually kind of kicking myself that I didn't tell them how much I love that because I think it's the coolest thing. And you know what? Quick story. I should explain this because I I said something about something called Zencaster at the end of our interview. So that is the website I use to record my interviews with people. And Matt, we couldn't get it to work for him. It's just a complicated situation. I'm not going to bog you down with the details, but we couldn't get it to work. And this was like 15 minutes of trying to get it to work. And I'm just like, oh, man, he's going to I'm afraid he's going to bail on the podcast. He's not going to want to do it. But that's not the case. Matt, he always had a a smile on his face and a skip in his step. He's a, a pure professional here. We bounced over to Zoom and we did the interview on Zoom. So that's why maybe it sounded a little different than my other interviews. But because of Zoom, I actually have the video recordings from our entire interview. So I'm going to ask Matt if it's okay if I, on the Patreon, put up some of the more visual elements because there's more to the interview I cut out where he showed me stuff that's really cool, showing me some more of his guitars and stuff. I'm going to reach out to Matt soon and ask him if it's okay if I show the, the patrons that because I think it's really cool and hopefully you'll appreciate it too. But hey, that's it for me this week. Again, if this is your first time listening, check out some of the other episodes. We got more interviews and over 40 deep dives into the episodes up to the end of season two. So uh, we'll keep on doing that until we run out of stuff. But in the meantime, I really want to say thank you to you for listening, of course, for, you know, you're, you're the reason this podcast exists. I want to give a shout out, of course, to my wife, Hannah, who's, who supports me during all of this and is fine with me locking myself away in the basement to record this podcast about a weird cartoon. And I want to really shout out all the Moonmasters over at patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden. 
for financially supporting this podcast and and helping me improve it and helping me, you know, with advertising for the podcast and everything like that. And of course, you know, they're getting something back in return. They are getting over nine hours of my coverage of the Colon Movie Film for Theaters, my coverage of other Adult Swim shows. I'm going to be putting other Aqua Teen stuff on there. Just thank you to all the Moon Masters. You guys really are the lifeblood of this podcast. And especially the number one in the Hood G tier patrons, the elite echelon of Moon Master. And I was so looking forward to shouting these guys out this week. But when I mentioned to Matt, you know, he was like, oh, I, I, I'm so jealous, Ronnie. You get to shout out the Moon Masters all the time. And I said, yeah, man, that's the, that's the best part of the job. And he said, you know what? If you don't let me do it this week, then I'm going to contact everyone who works on Aqua Teen and I'm going to blacklist you. They will not talk to you ever again. So I had no choice. I'm sorry. My hands were tied behind my back. And it's, it's the weirdest thing because Matt, he was so nice the entire time until the very end. He just became evil. He was evil Matt. Evil Matt. Take it away. Hey, guys, this is Matt Malero from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I just want to give a shout out to Sean, Ian, Captain Buford, Brian, Robison, and Reverend Raven 46. Thanks for listening. And you guys can hear me talk about my guitars any day of the week and come over for some barbecue. See, I have all this shit connected to my back mini, and I have all these guitars. This is like a, a musician's friend catalog back here you're showing me, man. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. Sweet, Sweetwater.